Okay, I know. Many of you already probably saw this coming. Every home chemist has got to make this chemical at some point. Yep, it's chloroform, aka trichloromethane and IUPAC terms. First, I have to go outside. I know, such a rare way to start a chem experiment, right? And to go retrieve my bleach like I'm digging for treasure. Even though everyone knows chloroform as this chemical that'll put you to sleep in seconds, it doesn't actually work like that, taking up to minutes to act and is also toxic for your organs. So never use it for any anesthetic purposes. There's a reason it's discontinued. Anyways, I'm only making it because it's a good solvent that I'll definitely be using in my future videos. Now you might be thinking, why in the world did he bury his bleach in the snow? Well, I didn't do that to make my life harder, but I actually left it outside the other night without realizing that it was gonna snow this much in Canada. I wanted my bleach to feel the breeze of the winter air because this reaction is exothermic, meaning it produces heat, and the bleach must be cooled to sub-zero temperatures to prevent this mixture from boiling. Chloroform is in fact strangely easy to make from household substances, and the last chemical I'll need is acetone. You will need some more advanced equipment if you want to purify it though. Now after getting everything set, since this reaction must be constantly cooled, I thought, why not continue using the coolness nature has already awarded me? So I went to go kind of make myself a workbench, I guess, using my pro snow carving skills. But wait, I need to do some calculations first on how much acetone to add. If I add an excess of acetone, it could form an azeotrope with the chloroform that is inseparable by distillation. Thus, the acetone must react to completion and should be the limiting reagent, aka the bleach must be in excess. Everything was working all nicely until I went to go check the concentration of the bleach to know how much sodium hypochlorite was in it for the calculations. After looking around on the label for a long time, I just couldn't find any information on its exact concentration. This was quite frustrating, and so I decided to look online, on their website and SDS sheets. I ended up hitting a dead end. Apparently, they don't indicate the concentration due to trade secrets. So I'm going to have to titrate the bleach to find the concentration of hypochlorite myself and get my hands dirty. Well, not literally, as I should be wearing gloves. So I made this quick setup of an inverted graduated cylinder in a beaker and a round bottom flask containing one mil of the bleach. For this titration, there were many candidates for the other reagent, but I decided to go with hydrogen peroxide, which reacts with the bleach to form oxygen as a product. I could then measure how much oxygen is produced from the reaction of 1 mil of the bleach solution and determine its concentration through some more math. So, after opening my addition funnel and adding in some hydrogen peroxide dropwise, you can see a bunch of fizzing and a pretty rapid production of O2. When it stopped fizzing and no more O2 was being produced, I ended up with 20 mils of dioxygen gas. Now it's time for some real calculations. So back on my workbench outside, I grabbed some paper and started doing some hardcore calculations. Now since this produced 20 mils of O2, and assuming 1 mole of O2 occupies 22.4 liters of gas at STP, yes, I was doing this in my garage so it was super cold, I can get the number of moles of O2, which is 8.93 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. Next, looking at the titration reaction equation, you can see how the ratio between the bleach and O2 is 1 to 1 meaning there was also 8.93 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of sodium hypochlorite in that 1 mil of bleach solution. Bingo! Now multiplying by 3,500 gives me the number of moles in 3.5 liters of the bleach, which is 3.126 moles. And I'm using 3.5 liters instead of the 3.57 because I'm going to be dumping out the 70 mils to make sure I have room to add the acetone and to shake it too. Now rounding down the number to 3 as I want the bleach in excess, I can look at the net haloform reaction equation and see that 3 molecules of bleach react with 1 molecule of acetone. So dividing 3 by 3 gives 1, which is the number of moles of acetone I'll need, which corresponds to 58 grams, which corresponds to 73 mils. Finally, I could start the experiment. I swear I just dropped the coldest chem calculation edit ever, like literally, my hands are freezing. So grabbing my graduated cylinder, I poured in the 73 mils of acetone required. At first, I poured it in the bleach solution very slowly because I was afraid it was going to get super hot all of a sudden, but I barely felt any warmth. After dumping in the entirety of the acetone, it probably only heated up like 2 degrees or 1. Maybe it's because my bleach is slushy from the freezing temperatures and much of the heat released from the reaction was spent on the latent heat of fusion. Also, the reaction between these two substances producing chloroform is a specific type of organic reaction called a haloform reaction, which has a wildly complicated mechanism. I can then cap the bleach bottle and shake it around for it to all evenly mix, 
then leave the cap partially open to prevent pressure buildup. I then left this in my garage overnight to let the chloroform settle, as its density is higher than that of water. However, at the last minute, I decided to go make another batch of chloroform, as I feel like the reaction of just this one bottle of bleach might not be enough. Thus, I repeated all of the steps again on another bottle of bleach. The next day, I got the two bottles of bleach which should theoretically have some chloroform at the bottom. I was a little unsure because the cans were opaque, and I had no idea if the reaction had actually worked. Now since most of the bleach solution was water, and only a few mils of chloroform settled, I'm gonna have to decant off the vast majority of the liquid above, and the chloroform will only be left at the bottom in the end. So after pouring out some of the top portion, I was reassured that it probably worked, as the bleach had almost lost all of its green color as seen previously. It took a while for all the water to be removed, and it was only in the last two pours where the chloroform started coming out. As you can see, the chloroform from this batch sinks to the bottom of the jar, and it looks pretty cool. Give it some time to settle as some drops may still be stuck at the top. The second batch kind of went the same way. After pouring off all of the side products and water on the top, I poured the chloroform into the same jar, and you can see how I got a good amount of it in the end. I also accidentally spilled some of the decanted solution, which is pretty harmless, but you can see how the pH is really high, which was expected. As you can see from the equation, sodium hydroxide is a side product. Now pouring off as much water as I could, I transferred all of the chloroform and a bit of the water into a separatory funnel. Then, after draining out the chloroform layer which is denser than water, I drained out the aqueous layer as waste as well. Now I have to do a washing step to ensure purity, called salting out. I simply have to make a saturated sodium chloride solution by using some water and table salt. And I know this was a dumb idea, but I have no idea why I used such a small beaker for it, so it splattered everywhere when I turned the stirring up a little too high. So after redoing it properly in a larger beaker, I was still left with some grains of salt left over, but I think it's fine for our purposes. After transferring this salt water into our separatory funnel, shaking it, and also venting the gas. I could then empty the clean chloroform into a round bottom flask and add in some anhydrous magnesium sulfate to dry the chloroform as well. As you can see, the cloudy color basically goes away and it gets a lot clearer after its addition and swirling around a bit. Now, the last step, to ensure a high purity of the chloroform, we can perform a simple distillation so I quickly made the setup with a hot water bath. As you can see, the first few drops coming over are impurities and are cloudy, and so they are collected and discarded. The rest coming over is nice and clear, pure chloroform, boiling at around 61C. A hot water bath is recommended for better temperature control. I then measured how much chloroform I obtained, and thus its yield. The density was also pretty close. After bottling it up, it is essential to add about 1% of pure ethanol by volume to make sure that the chloroform does not react with the oxygen in the air to form phosgene, an extremely toxic gas, which is why you should also close the bottle tightly. It should be protected from light to prevent this reaction from forming, thus I also wrapped it in aluminum foil off camera. As you can see here, when the ethanol is added to the chloroform, it kind of becomes cloudy, but after giving it some time, it seems to clear up. This was kind of confusing, does anyone have an explanation for this, please let me know. Anyways, that's about it for this video. If you did make it this far, congratulations and please consider subscribing. I'll see you in the next one.